Welcome to Headline Buster's first episode in 2020, brought to you by The Point with me, Liu Xin. Over the next 30 minutes, I will dissect more China-related stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to our panel to compensate for the missing pieces of your China puzzle. Join us in real time by sending us your comments or questions via the CGTN page on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube or Weibo. If you're watching this live on the CGTN application, email us at thepointwithalex at cgtn.com. Let me know what you think. We start our live streaming every Friday at 10.30 a.m. Beijing time. Do get in touch and we just might read out your comments. Today's topic, Xinjiang, which is still making international headlines. For more up-to-date picture of what is going on in Xinjiang, I would like to encourage you to visit the CGTN website. Now, one of my fellow journalists here at CGTN, Wang Guan, recently went to Xinjiang. In his reports, what's China's re-education camp in Xinjiang really about? And Western propaganda on Xinjiang camps rebutted. We interviewed people who had graduated from the vocational training centers, improved their professional skills, and mandarin abilities and have now got jobs in different industries. In recent years, Xinjiang has made great efforts in supporting employment. According to the region's Department of Human Resources and Social Security, Xinjiang created over 75,000 jobs for poor residents in the first 11 months of 2019 and launched a series of free skill classes and other training opportunities for more than 180,000 people. Also, the region has implemented several supportive measures to promote the employment, to pr improve the employment uh, environment, I should say, such as providing loans and subsidies to startup firms. 2.4 billion yuan, about 355 million U.S. dollars, was invested in the first half of 2019 to do exactly that. And let's move on to see some other development, developing industries and increasing employment opportunities are regarded as important measures to fight poverty. Xinjiang used to be one of the least developed regions in China and the poverty rate in the region dropped from 23 percent at the beginning of 2014 to 6.5 percent and more than 2.38 million people have been lifted out of poverty. That's almost one-third the population of say, Switzerland. Also, by the end of 2019, over 2,400 poverty-stricken villages in northwest uh, uh, the region of Xinjiang had their power grid upgraded. Nearly 9 million residents in those villages can now enjoy a stable power supply. But how are the foreign media, especially Western media, reporting on the efforts of China and Xinjiang? Do they mention that work, important work, has been done to lift people out of poverty and create a more prosperous and stable society? No. Instead, they opt for a narrative of negativity, which is not based on factual reporting, but based on opinion-driven pieces. With that in mind, let's take a look at how this latest development in what I fully admit is a long and difficult process has been reported. For this week's first article, let's turn to our usual friend, the New York Times. The headline reads, Inside China's push to turn Muslim minorities into an army of workers. Wow! The subheading goes on to say, the Communist Party wants to remote Xinjiang's minorities into loyal blue-collar workers to supply Chinese factories with cheap labor. Both of these statements are gross mischaracterization in my eyes of what is happening in Xinjiang. Sadly, this type of claim has become commonplace. Maybe not just in New York Times, but in many other media outlets in the West when reporting on Xinjiang. Let's take a look at the article to see how they made their justification, or they try to make their justifications for these inflammatory headlines. The article opens by stating, the order from Chinese officials was blunt and urgent. Villages from Muslim minorities should be pushed into jobs, willing or not. Quotas would be set and families penalized if they refuse to go along. Wow, the people in Xinjiang are being encouraged to take jobs, but the headline specifically says that people are being pushed into getting jobs. What do they mean by pushed? 
physically marched onto their office or workplace. They don't put quotation marks around the word push. But what really happens? Do these people face some kind of retribution? No. Not according to this article. There's no evidence in this article that these people are being pushed or first forced into work. The article goes on to make the claim that, and I quote, the Communist Party wants to remote Xinjiang's minorities into loyal blue-collar workers to supply Chinese factories with cheap labor. Once again, I would call for physical evidence of this. Physical evidence, ladies and gentlemen. Where is it? If there is no hard evidence to prove what they're saying, then it simply amounts to nothing but slander. Because of the rampant poverty and difficult circumstances, there has been a sizable number of people in Xinjiang who have not have a level, an adequate level of education. Some parents, okay, from ethnic minorities, and it is a fact, I'm saying, some of them do not send their children to school, whether it is compulsory or not, whether it is free or not. So that makes it hard for many people to find a job and earn a living. So with skills, training, and vocational training, these people are now being helped to make a living, to stand on their own feet. They can have the possibility of developing a career and possibly a future. Does it seem only reasonable? Doesn't it seem only reasonable or sensible for these people to support themselves through employment? China's Xinjiang policy was condemned by many in the Western media for offering education and now the same thing is happening with the assistance they're receiving to try to find employment, which is a key tenant to many people's future and many people's livelihood. If people who are receiving social security or welfare benefits in the West are not deemed to be doing everything they can to find a job, they will lose financial support. Isn't that the case? Now the same is more or less true of what is happening in China, in Xinjiang. The government want these people to find job and yet this is characterized as being pushed to get a job, a kind of slave labor and abuse of human rights. The article continues, such orders are part of an aggressive campaign to remote Xinjiang Muslim minorities, mostly Uyghurs and Kazakhs, into an army of workers for factories and other big employers. I'm not sure what the link is between being remoted, as the article suggests, and offering employment to people, not just in the Uyghur ethnic group, or the Kazakh, or the Han, or other ethnic groups. What kind of evidence, once again, is offered to uphold this supposition that a job in a factory strips away the fabric of uh, who these people are and turns them into a, quote, army of workers? The article argues that it is the collective policies of the Chinese government which, when taken as a whole, amount to this remoting of ethnic minority groups in an attempt to make them more like their Han counterparts, which is the largest ethnic group in, Ch in China. They also suggest that many people in China see this as laudable act, while Uyghur critics disagree and call it ethnic subjugation. So after claiming that Uyghurs are being remoded, the journalists only support their own argument by their own collective assessment of the situation. The article also used a directive, a document, to back up its claims about forced labor, but just picks a few sentences and words from the document. This directive is mainly about how to implement the employment transfer system, a so-called employment transfer system across the country, including education and vocational tr training for surplus labor and transferring them to vacant jobs in the county or some other places in Xinjiang. The language used here kind of report to, uh, refers to a kind of military style management as mentioned in the article, but only as a way of emphasizing the company's regulations and self-management, not as a framework for instilling a party loyalty or as a form of punishment or in any way. Do the media really understand the meaning of such a paper? Do they ever consider if the translation is accurate? Have they communicated and verified it with the local government? Have they taken it out of context? Do they know how these principles are being implemented on the ground? This one document has been misinterpreted in my eyes, taken out of the context, and then used as the supposed evidence for the claims that Xinjiang is being converted into a slave labor camp. Is it really acceptable to use such flimsy evidence to construct such a damning narrative? Not in my opinion. Next, let's turn to an article published on 
foreignpolicy.com. The headline spares no punches, reading Xinjiang's new slavery, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, Xinjiang's new slavery. The article argues that people in Xinjiang have become slaves of the Communist Party. No quotation marks used here, mind that. Again, there is a distinct lack of evidence here. But I'll come on to the details later. First, I would like to look at the term slavery. When I think of a slave, imagine someone who has been tied up in handcuffs, forced and beaten to work for no money. Imagine what happened in the United States. Then you know what slaves are really about. Or what is happening in, in present day the U UK when people smuggle themselves or being smuggled across the English Channel to work in slavery in the UK. These are slavery. Now, this piece doesn't offer any corroboration after referring to those in Xinjiang as slaves. The piece acknowledges that there is data to support Beijing's claims that people are graduating from the vocational training centers and getting jobs. However, it then succeeds by claiming that Beijing's motivations are to subdue its northwestern minorities predicated upon a perverse and intrusive combination of coercive labor, intergenerational separation, and complete social control. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I run out of breath saying these big words. I don't even know what they mean after all of these big words piled up together. It says, the article I mean, China is doing this by encouraging companies from the East to open factories in the region, but why is portrayed as a negative thing and degraded as perverse? Are investment and job opportunities not needed there? Or would it be preferable to let unemployment and radicalization take hold and let the death from terrorism continue to rise in Xinjiang? Answer these questions. Now the article then goes on to criticize the wages of some of those who have been provided with work. To do this, it has used a publicly available spreadsheet from Xinjiang's Yakan County. They said they have looked at data from 148 who have now graduated from the vocational training centers. The article reads, two-thirds only earned 800 renminbi per month, about 100 US dollar, and the average stated wage was 1,228 renminbi, about 175 US dollars a month, around the level of the minimum wage in the region. I would like to point out the size of the sample, 148 people, with a population of almost 22 million. Is this hardly a representative sample size? that holds up to scrutiny. Yet, the articles use this kind of so-called evidence to argue that the people in Xinjiang are being made slaves. People who are being paid a wage, although low maybe, that needs to be looked into, but they are being paid a wage for their work. And that doesn't seem like slavery to me. The piece also called for consumers around the world to boycott products that are produced in the region. However, this is in direct contradiction to the Better Cotton Initiative, the world's largest cotton standard, who recently said a continued presence and engagement in Xinjiang will continue to benefit local farmers. Mind the words, continue, meaning it has been, it is, and it will continue to benefit. And the word benefit, it doesn't say enslave, it says benefit. Why does this initiative make such statement? They clearly have looked into the situation and made their own conclusion. It will continue to benefit the local farmers. Well, this article by Foreign Policy does acknowledge this, but continues to claim that the involvement of foreign industry would only be to the detriment of workers in Xinjiang, even after the Bed and Cotton Initiative argued that foreign companies doing business in Xinjiang will benefit the local farmer. Well. Again, I'm almost going speechless and very angry, honestly. But I'll take a short break and I'll leave it up to you to make up your, mo your mind. Send us your comments or questions for discussion and I'll have guests joining me after the break. They come from the Chinese University of Political Science and Law, Professor Huo Zheng Xing and Anna Tangan, a current affairs commentator. Stay with us.
Welcome back to this edition of Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point with me, Li Xin. Uh, joining me here on the set is Professor Huo Zhengxing from the China University of Political Science and Law and Aina Tangan, a current affairs commentator. Gentlemen, welcome to Headline Buster and Happy New Year to you. So, I was <laughs> very angry, but uh, it really makes me angry watching these kind of headlines. I think there might be problems, you know, there might be ways that these things can be done better, either education or, un uh, or employment or poverty or alleviation, but to call that things like slavery, you know, or to remote people into an army of workers, these kind of headlines, it, it, make, it makes me burn to, to see them. Well, it, it's an extension of social media. I mean, right now, the traditional press, I mean, the New York Times, really? I mean, trying to go head to head with the kind of sensational stuff you read, you know, every day on Facebook and things like that, it, it doesn't seem uh, very professional, and it isn't. No. I mean, you, you have a story that, that jumps from, you know, I, I, I read some papers, <laughs> all right, and from that, I know everything that's going on in Xinjiang. Mm. I mean, it's, it's incredible. China has embarked on an anti-poverty campaign. Everybody has applauded that. Nations uh, around the world should be emulating it. Now, in order to do an, uh, anti-poverty, yes, you have to train people. I mean, that might sound a bit strange, but it, unless you train them, they can't get a job. If they can't get a job, they can't lift themselves out of poverty. Now, this is happening all over China. China has a very, very uh, robust system of technical uh, education in order to put people to work. Why, why is it wrong in Xinjiang, but it's just fine if it's in Guangzhou or Guangdong? I mean, it's, it's really just things. It's almost as if, and if China solved mortality, I mean, the headline would read, China in devious plot to overpopulate the world. So at this point, it doesn't seem that uh, China can get a fair shake in the international press. Everything that China does is wrong, and it's, it's going to continue. Yeah, almost. Professor Huo, what's your take on these stories? Well, I'm not a, an expert at journalism, so I believe that a news report can be judged policy from different perspectives. However, from the perspective of law, I think there must be some bottom line. That, that is to say, the report must be objective and do not touch the bottom of law. I, I noticed that. When you say touch the bottom of law, do you mean that they need to provide hard evidence or they need to... What, do you, what exactly do you mean by that? Right. I, I noticed that the article says that the policies in Xinjiang violates human rights and law. So I'm wondering what human rights and what law does the policies violate? In my opinion, is that both international law and Chinese constitutional law says that the, the human rights, basic human rights, are protected. So what are basic human rights? I think that the most important basic human rights are the rights to have a life, to have a better life, to development. So I think that policy tries to give these Chinese language skills, work skills, to ensure that it can have a better life. That's the protect of human rights instead of violation of human rights. In the pursuit of human rights, whether it's yeah, successful this, this, is one thing or not, but uh, I think the starting point is definitely not to in, uh, remote them into some uh, different people. No, China. I mean, but this is one of the things that, yeah, unfortunately, there's a chasm between East and West, and it centers around this idea of what are human rights. If you talk to somebody in, the, in Europe or America, you say human rights, they talk about political rights. Right. And it's always married to uh, democracy, the right to vote. So when you come to Asia, exactly what you just said, human rights are economic based. The, the idea that you can be safe in your home, on the street, all right, in your place of work. You know, every day we hear you know, more gun deaths, knife deaths, all of these In one day things. in the United States, 88 people died because of shooting. And do, it, do, they, do they consider that to be human well, rights, or do see, they want to consider that to be political right? You know, but this that, is that's a, the appalling. difficulty. Yeah. From, uh, from an Asian point of view, when people see this, they look at the United States and say, you have failed. Government has failed to do the basic things necessary to protect the people, to give them economic opportunities. So this is the difficulty. We can talk about this forever. 
Yeah. But until people start opening up and saying, look, perhaps there is a different point of view, especially for societies at a different economic level. Let's take a look at this comment from Dada Joshua. I think China should just continue the progress it has made in that region. A lot of regions in that kind of situation in the world would have loved this type of interventions from the government to not to be scared when sleeping at night. Well, I think this person knows exactly what you know, we are talking about. I mean, Xinjiang is not a place that is always just you know, rosy picture, good life. Thousands of terrorist attacks happened in that region. But our focus today really is about the job, the employment situation. And I think you made a very good point, Aina, just now. Because if you look at the, a lot of people when they talk about human rights, they talk about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and they, they say, look, this is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. China is also part of it. It says political rights, it says right of vote, it says right of um, freedom. But I strongly encourage people to read the original text of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they will find there are a lot of economic rights, a lot of rights about having decent jobs, having safe shelter, having a basic education, having medical care for people. You know, in a lot of sense, the United States, I would say, are not doing very well, but they just say, we have freedom, we have rights, we have this. And in Europe, the, there's a European some kind of a charter of declaration, a charter of human rights as well. And in the, in the very beginning, they say, this is in honoring of some of the rights enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, meaning the political part of it. So I think, you know, that part, that part really yeah, has to be made very, very clear. It should be made clear, but the problem is, are people listening? Increasingly oh. today, it's polarized. They only want to hear a, an echo chamber of what they believe regardless of any facts. And we see this uh, politically around the world. The, the fact is, a lot of democracies are in crisis because people are not willing to invest back into their society. They're not willing to say to their governments, you are, there is a fundamental contract between the individual and society, and these are the things you must do. You must provide safety. If I don't feel safe in my home, and the government says, if you don't feel safe, get a gun. You know, that means that the That's government has <laughs> abrogated its, uh, its duty, its yeah. primary duty. And then we start talking about economic things. It's completely reversed in the West. It's definitely not the approach uh, taken here in China. And in terms of employment, the government definitely sees it as part of its responsibility to provide at least the opportunities. Um, so, Professor Huo, Help us understand it, or help our readers understand a little bit exactly how this back to work program work function in China, not just in Xinjiang, but in general. Give us the context here, please. Well, I think that the, uh, the philosophy of administration between West and East is quite different. Just like the difference between Western medicine and traditional Chinese medicine. As you say that when some violence happened in the US, the government said, okay, you have the gun, you can protect yourself. However, according to Chinese philosophy, where we have to solve the deep-rooted problems, just like a traditional Chinese medicine. Whenever a person has a, a disease, the Chinese medicine tells the patient how to increase his whole you know, body to, to, to fight the, 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 the disease in a comprehensive way. Mm. So I think that bringing people back to jobs is, is just like a Chinese traditional philosophy, to try to solve the deep-rooted problem of terrorism. If these people, they have work skills, language skills, and I think that... And they're busy? Yes. Making a living for their family? Yes. They have decent life. They are respected, ordered by the society. I don't think that we, they will accept terrorism or extre e extremism. Mm. But that's, well, but that's being criticized. Let, let's take a look at this uh, comment here by this person called Geopolitics Eurasia. You've got to train people to lift them out of poverty, you know. It does sound strange, but it is true. Again, echoing, I know what you said, you know, that people have to be trained, but somehow you can't leave it to themselves. And I think that's what the Chinese government has been trying well, to do. It, let, let's say that uh, the Chinese government did nothing. And in Xinjiang, you, what, you have uh, terrorist attacks going on, increasing friction between uh, the people who are living there. And you have a large part of the population which is not being educated. I mean, in, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, many places around the world, the same Western voices will say, look, they're, they're not educating women. They're taking the girls out of school. That should not be allowed. But somehow, 
when it comes to Xinjiang, oh, it's okay. No, that, you, you're violating their human rights Double by standards. not allowing. Double well, standards. But, but the Paul. hypocrisy of that, it, it, it's, it's silly. No one is winning by this. It's not like the U.S. has embraced um, you know, Islam. It, you know, they're bombing people every day. They've started the wars, which have created a lot of the hard tensions and radicalism in, in, in the Middle East. To be getting up on a soapbox and start talking about you know, how things should be. I mean, always start at home. Lead by example. China is leading by example to the world. It, has a, it, it is in the process of eradicating low-level poverty. It's not that poverty will be solved, but it's an ongoing journey. Yeah. And you're doing what's necessary to do that. Why is the West being critical of it? Purely 360 degrees of pressure. The U.S., uh, other countries 720 say, degree of pressure, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> well, it goes round and round. But, you know, it's, it's, it, it's sad. It gets too much. At, at a time when uh, countries should be coming together with 7 billion people with climate change, uh, with, uh, you know, a, a I think probable... It's part of, sorry, I think it's part of, like, you know, China is getting more and more uh, powerful, stronger, uh, greater presence. So the, the 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 feeling is that there is a new China scare almost. You know, so mm -hmm. China, uh, Xinjiang, or Hong Kong, or some uh, Taiwan. It's not scare. Those are no? very deliberate. The, these are things that uh, simply the administration is trying to use in a, in a in a PR campaign to vilify China. In each case, they're trying to egg China on into doing something that they can call out to the international press as this is a totalitarian government. They're repressing their people. I mean, it, it doesn't make any real sense, all right? We all see the pictures, the problem, the same pictures, for, for instance, in Hong Kong. We see the same ones, but what, what's the interpretation? In the U.S., they see uh, uh, somebody knifing a police officer, and they say, oh, it's a freedom. This is about freedom, <laughs> right? Professor Huo, uh, what's your take here? Well, I... I Why we're seeing this 720-degree <laughs> <laughs> scrutiny on China? Yeah, I think that, yeah, the, the, the West, they're paying more, more attention to what's happening in China. But unfortunately, they're focusing on, you know, I think they are selectively, you know, uh, pay attention to some things. And, uh, but I, I noticed one in, uh, very interesting point in the article. As you mentioned just now, the New York Times says that these Chinese receive salaries, and, but they, they do not receive very high salary. They receive, uh, the salary that we receive is only mi minimum level. I think it's logic. Uh, well, because they are the, uh, the junior workers. They, before training, they do not have work skills. skills. So I think it's it's unreasonable to give them very high salary, but I do believe well, no, that. No, I think you should give them twenty thousand dollars a yeah. month because they can so. <laughs> Maybe the U.S. can no, pay no. for that. No, no. The, the real test <laughs> of this is if you if you joke. go if you go in yeah. and start looking at what the wages are for anybody in that situation. It's two hundred dollars a month. Now that sounds very low, but it's only double that if you go to Guangdong, yeah. and the, the the price of uh, the cost of living is much lower. Right. We have to, anyway, the context is very, very important. Yes. We have to leave it there. Professor Huo Zhenxing from the China University of Political Science and Law and Ina Tang, a current affairs commentator. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Headline Buster, coming to you from The Point with me, Liu Xing. Thanks for having watched this live uh, streaming. Write us your thoughts and comments and join us next time, next week, at the exact same time. See you next week.